Last Wednesday, a court in Afghanistan convicted three Americans of torturing Afghans in an illegal private prison. The alleged ringleader of the operation is a former Green Beret named Jonathan Adima, his nickname Jack. Okay. Meet Jack. This is Jack in Afghanistan holding an AK-47 and riding on the back of a horse. Here he is on the night of his wedding, flanked by two security guards with his bride in his lap. His wedding took place at his Arabian style house in Mexico, which was inexplicably located right next to a traditional style Japanese home. To say that Jonathan Keith Idema, aka Jack, was a bizarre eccentric would be an understatement. Over the course of this tale, you'll come to understand exactly what I mean. But first, let's go back to Jack riding on a horse in Afghanistan. This footage was taken in the early 2000s, only a few years into the war in Afghanistan. Jack was not there as an active duty soldier. He was not a private military contractor. Instead, he was a 45-year-old ex-con that entered Afghanistan after 9-11 with the goal of collecting the $25 million reward on Osama bin Laden's head. The fact that he was a civilian did nothing to stop him from traveling to a war-torn country and making a chaotic situation even more screwy. Osama's got his RPG. Back there! Tell that guy, what's he? Stop that car! No, but put your fucking hands up! I'll blow your fucking brains out! In Afghanistan, Jack managed to trick the US government, Afghan officials, and the media into believing that he was an active duty special forces operative working on behalf of the Pentagon. Kill as many Taliban and Al Qaeda as you can and try to take Kabul in six months. Well, in 62 days, Kabul was free. I want to press how insane this situation was. Jack just rolled into a war-torn country pretending to be an active duty Green Beret and did it so well that NATO coalition forces helped him apprehend suspected terrorists in three different raids. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Come on. Don't move. Hands up. Hands up. Now. Larry, Charlie, take the other room. Down, down, hands off. Eventually things went way too far after Jack created a fake paramilitary group called Task Force Saber 7, rented a property which he turned into a private prison, and started torturing Afghans who he suspected to be terrorists. Jack and the rest of Task Force Saber 7 were eventually arrested and charged in Afghan courts. But before I get to that, I want to get down to the essence of who Jack Idema was. This was the movie that changed everything for Jack. The Green Berets, co-directed by and starring John Wayne. Now this movie was pretty controversial when it came out since it clashed with growing anti-war sentiments at the time by unabashedly celebrating the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. Protests were held against the movie. The late film critic Roger Ebert called it offensive propaganda. And watching it made a 12-year-old Jack Idema decide to become a Green Beret. Jack enlisted in the army on February 25th, 1975, when he was 18 years old. Although he achieved his dream of becoming a Green Beret, his military career was turbulent and short-lived. During phase one of his special forces qualification course, he was caught stealing. His commanding officer wrote that he had an irrational tendency towards violence after he attacked another officer. In an evaluation report, a captain described him as, quote, without a doubt, the most unmotivated, unprofessional, immature enlisted man that I have ever known. Jack's stint in the army lasted three years, and in the end, he was honorably discharged and banned from ever re-enlisting. Although Jack would later claim that he had 12 years experience in the special forces, 22 years in combat training, and 18 years in covert military special operations, in reality, he never saw any combat. Following his time in the army, he joined the reserves for three years, and then the individual ready reserves for another three years after that. So the next 17 years of Jack Idema's life can be summed up as being chock full of petty crime, failing businesses, and tough guy antics. Jack was arrested a lot of times during the 80s and 90s for things ranging from discharging a firearm into a dwelling to being a fugitive from justice. Surprisingly, he managed to escape being convicted for all of these charges except for his arrest in 1994, which I'll get to later. 
To understand Jack Idema, you have to understand the subculture and readership of Soldier of Fortune magazine. Soldier of Fortune magazine built itself as the journal for professional adventurers. It covered stuff like paramilitary operations, guns, wars, and spies. Its readership was mostly made up of ex-military types and military fetishists with a desire for excitement, adventure, and action. Flipping through the pages of Soldier of Fortune magazine gives you a better sense of why Rambo wannabes loved it so much. Underwater knife fighting techniques. Another example is a multi-part series on urban street survival. Much like most of the Soldier of Fortune readership, Jack Idema was a man who didn't get his chance to fight in a war, even though he desperately wanted to. So he decided to use his short stint in the Special Forces as a selling point to establish businesses which relied on people believing that he was the ultimate badass. He opened a counterterrorism training school called Counter Academy, which attracted a clientele of military personnel, police officers, and weekend warriors looking for excitement. In a new segment covering Counter Group, Jack demonstrates the type of training the school gave. training, we will have little or no hope of identifying the hostage and the terrorists. In this drill, circle, diamond, square, you will pick out the correct target. Around this time, Jack also started a mail order business selling paintball equipment and non-lethal military gear. He's still respected to this day by paintball enthusiasts who regard him as a pioneer in the sport who sold high quality equipment. He also organized Special Forces Expos, which attracted the Soldier of Fortune crowd, and acted as a venue for him to sell his gear. In 1991, he met a subcontractor who offered him a job training police officers in Lithuania. After spending some time in Lithuania, Jack contacted the Pentagon and the FBI claiming to have unraveled an underworld plot. The Russian Mafia, Jack said, was smuggling portable nuclear weapons and backpacks out of the country. When the FBI asked Jack for his sources, he refused to reveal them out of fear that the FBI was compromised by KGB agents. When Jack returned to the United States in 1992, his business, IDEMA Combat Systems, was floundering. In an effort to save his business, he set up a shell company to purchase supplies which he did not pay for. In 1994, he was arrested along with his girlfriend, Patricia Dawn Glosson, for defrauding 60 companies out of $250,000. In court, Jack legally represented himself. He argued that he was the victim of an FBI plot and claimed that the agency carried a vendetta against him because he did not reveal his sources for the information he provided to them concerning the backpack nuke smuggling operation. The judge presiding over his case said he thought that insanity might be Jack's best defense. On April 11, 1995, Jack was sentenced to four years in prison and fined $250,000. After being sentenced, Jack screamed that he was innocent and that he would sue the FBI. While working on this video, I reached out to everyone who knew Jack in real life to ask them about him. And that's how I found Ron Barber. Ron was in prison at the same time as Jack. And uh, he was inside for, uh, well, I'll let Ron tell you why. My name is Ronald Gene Barber. I was a member of the Army Intelligence working for NSA. In early 1994, I was charged with the attempted assassination of former President Bill Clinton. I was sentenced to five years in federal prison, plus uh, three years uh, probation. Ron told me that he was hosting a party and that he was secretly recorded while he was drunk, saying, I was supposedly I was going to shoot Bill yeah, I was going to get him when he was uh, jogging, and then I was going to hot put it over to the White House, leap the fence and run in, and grab her and stop her to death. Found guilty of making threats against the president, he was sent to a prison where he met Jack Idema. So you told me before, the last time that we talked, that you and uh, like a group of people that he kind of put together in, in prison... You guys were all filing lawsuits, and I think you mentioned that one of them was like an attorney. Some of the uh, 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 the guys there that were on this uh, legal team of the Demas really were lawyers. In fact, one of them was a former senator from uh, New Jersey, state senator, not a U.S. senator. Uh, Dima, he had a good legal mind. He was suing everybody that he, I guess he ever met in his life. He was uh, Dima was just just to be uh, spiteful and be vengeful. Uh, he would, uh, yeah, they put him on, maybe send him to the mess hall, put him on pots and pans, and he would, uh, he would sue the guard that uh, 
gave him the detail. He made himself very unpopular with the prison administration and the guards, but very popular with the uh, the inmates. And he always wanted to do that. He always wanted to uh, uh, stand out in the crowd and be noticed and uh, be a hero, so to speak. And Ron's right. Jack's life's mission was to be seen as a heroic, larger-than-life badass, which is why between filing numerous frivolous lawsuits and appeals from his prison cell, he was also occupied with trying to adapt his life story into a feature film. Jack wanted to find someone who could tell his story the way he wanted it to be told. In other words, the story he wanted to be told was like fan fiction of himself. In his version of events, he possessed a storied history full of top secret operations, which were so hush-hush that they were scrubbed from his military record. According to him, he was, quote, one of the only two dozen elite super secret Hua Rang Do warriors clandestinely trained at Fort Bragg. He said he had top grades in every subject and was on his way to Harvard Law before deciding to become a Green Beret. He was also a part of the Army's top secret SOT course, where they trained their elite ninja type commando teams. So Jack really wanted to adapt his story into a film, and it was while he was in prison where he finally found an end. He met an award-winning CBS journalist and documentary filmmaker named Gary Skurka, who paid him a visit after reading about him in an issue of Soldier of Fortune magazine. In Gary Skurka, Jack found a documentarian who promised to share his story with the world. This is a story of perseverance and patriotism, friendships and devotion to duty, and treachery at the highest levels of the United States government. Robbed of his freedom, they thought he would break. They were wrong. Now, Keith Idema is out and ready to tell the world his remarkable story. After three years, Jack was released from prison on September 16, 1997, and he returned to Cumberland County in Fayetteville, North Carolina. While working on this documentary, I was given access to a vast amount of Jack's personal files for the purposes of this project. Sifting through his documents shows bits and pieces of Jack's life after being released from prison. In a letter written to his probation officer, he requested to travel from North Carolina to New York and then to New Hampshire on business for his employer, Static Control Components. The director of Static Control Components was Jack's lawyer named Skip London. Skip is a property attorney. He met Jack in the early 90s and represented him. On the phone, Skip told me that Jack worked at Static Control Components for a few years as the head of a team of security guards. Skip indicated that Jack was hypervigilant. He told me, quote, some people you have to tell to start, but he was the kind of guy that you had to tell to stop. Soon, Jack started a business called the Ultimate Pet Resort with his prison pen pal turned lover, Victoria Running Wolf. It was described as a cozy bed and breakfast for dogs and cats. Jack was an animal lover, and from what I can tell, he possessed an idealistic vision for the pet resort's facilities, which consisted of open spaces for the pets to roam freely and a promise to never enclose them in cages. Prominently featured on the Ultimate Pet Resort's website was Jack's dog named Sarge. Jack claimed that Sarge could parachute out of helicopters and could sniff out bombs. He also said that he was saving Sarge's DNA to have him cloned after his death. So the late 90s were fairly eventful for Jack. He was staying out of trouble, his business was doing well, and he was working on seeing his life story made into a motion picture. But then, 9-11 happened. In an unpublished manuscript that Jack wrote called The Sixth Pillar, Task Force 7, he wrote, Life was good. I had a house, a dog, a hot tub, a new turbocharged Grand Prix, a great job, and a beautiful wife. My old enemy, the Soviet Union, was extinct. Everything was grand. Then the fucking terrorists blew up New York. Like so many others, our lives were changed that day. But my destiny was clear. I would engage terrorists wherever they were, wherever they hid. Wherever they ran, I would die before I let them do this again. In order to enter Afghanistan, Jack contacted a humanitarian aid worker and Vietnam vet named Ed Artis. He told Artis that Gary Skurka of National Geographic wanted to make a documentary about his humanitarian organization, Knightsbridge International, and their efforts in Afghanistan. In the email, Jack described the idea of the documentary, saying, you know, ex-military guys doing humanitarian work while bombs fall around them kind of stuff. Coverage is good, but with me, it's mission first. It's not about me. If you've been paying attention, you know by now that that surely was not the case. Of course, Jack planned to make it all about himself. As Robert Pelton writes in his book, License to Kill, Jack had never been to Afghanistan or been seriously involved in humanitarian work, but saw an opportunity to use the lens of a documentarian's camera to record for posterity all the heroic deeds he intended to commit, or at least dramatize. 
It wasn't long before it became obvious to Ed Artis what Jack's intentions for the project were. According to Artis, when he first met Jack, Jack announced that he wanted to quote, kill every fucking Afghan I see. He recounts that Jack tried very hard to make himself the star of the documentary and said quote, he's the dumbest fuck I have ever met. Artis recalled a time when Jack pushed a humanitarian aid worker out of the way so he could pose for a photo op with an expensive EKG machine meant to be delivered to those in need. Eventually, Artis became fed up with Jack's behavior and told Gary Skirka that he would not participate in the documentary unless Jack stayed away while they were shooting it. On November 11, 2001, Gary Skirka was badly injured by shrapnel from an artillery blast and was medevaced back to the United States a few weeks earlier than he planned to leave. A reporter named Tim Friend said that after he and a group of others carried Skirka to safety and dressed his wounds, Jack arrived with a cameraman. Quote, Just when we finished dressing Skirka's leg, Jack runs up screaming. He rips off the bandages and redresses the wounds. Basically, he was acting in front of the camera. With Skirka gone, there was no documentary left to work on. Jack was only there as a security guard, not a filmmaker, and Ed Artis wanted nothing to do with him. Sometime later, Ed Artis faxed this warning about Jack to the US authorities. This man is a very dangerous person by virtue of his carelessness and stupidity. And before he gets someone killed, possibly me, or someone traveling with me inside Afghanistan, he needs to be removed from the area. So after a couple months, Jack was stuck in Afghanistan with no documentary and with nothing to do. So he adapted. Jack started tracking down the anti-Taliban soldiers of the Northern Alliance and making connections with them so he could pass himself off as a Northern Alliance advisor. It was around this time that he took a stack of pictures of him posing with the Northern Alliance, saving children, dressing wounds, and staging other photo ops to make himself seem heroic. By this point in the war, the anti-Taliban forces in the Northern Alliance had taken over much of the country. Whether they knew that Jack wasn't officially sanctioned was unclear. Jack put together a small militia of Northern Alliance fighters and started offering journalists safe escorts into the Battle of Tora Bora for the price of $1,000 a head. Tora Bora was where the action was, and it was the story that most war journalists in the country wanted to report on, but it was far too dangerous to travel there on their own. Eric Campbell, a correspondent for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, recalls that four journalists had been murdered on the road from Kabul to Jalalabad less than a week earlier, and that he was stuck in Kabul until he met Jack who offered to take him there. Journalists were used to special forces operatives who did not speak to the press due to their code of silence. But Jack would talk willingly, and Jack always had a way to back up his air of credibility. In an article written by a journalist named Richard S. Ehrlich, who interviewed Jack several times, he writes, Jack displayed a resume that he kept on his laptop, which listed military badges he said he had earned. But his biography stopped in 1991. When asked about the 1990s, Jack would say, For over 10 years, I've been black, implying secret missions he could not divulge. Well, Jack, I suppose uh, the question people are wondering is, is what's a Green Beret veteran doing leading a security convoy in Afghanistan? Well, we've, uh, we've had a problem since I got here with security of journalists, uh, security of... of aid workers, humanitarian aid workers, and, and even foreigners. As you know, there were, there were one guy killed in Talakan, four were, were robbed and killed on the road from Jalalabad. Um, when the National Geographic guy was wounded, I was there in Calicutta, um, and we tried to air asset him out and get him out of medevac, and we had a difficult time doing it. So we've been batting around the idea of security protection force for journalists, aid workers, and, and foreigners. In October 2001 and June 2002, Jack appeared in over 1,000 U.S. newspapers and over 250 television news shows. He served as a commentator on Fox News and was paid $500 per appearance. It was a lucrative hustle and it helped fund his stay in Afghanistan. On one occasion, he charged a room full of journalists $100 per person to attend a press conference with a local warlord named Hazrat Ali. It was later revealed that he duped the warlord by telling him that the journalists were Pentagon officials. Jack was clearly a bullshit artist of the highest degree, but that's only part of the reason why he was able to trick so many people. The emergence of private military contractors and guns for hire created an environment where it became difficult to distinguish Jack from an officially sanctioned mercenary. Jack looked the part with his dark shades, desert camouflage fatigues, and military haircut. There were hundreds of guys like that in Afghanistan at the time, ex-military types working for PMCs. However, the obvious difference between them and Jack was that they were legit and he was not. As an Afghan businessman told the New York Times, if you're blonde or a Westerner and you're wearing black sunglasses, carrying a pistol and a leg holster, and driving a car without a license plate, nobody would ever question who you are. People just assume you're CIA or special forces or someone dangerous. People stay away from you. 
Even though Jack looked the part, he gained a controversial reputation among many war journalists who ridiculed him behind his back. In his book, Robert Pelton writes that journalists would call Jack Mr. Potato Head due to his mercurial ability to portray himself as a private military contractor or CIA or a special forces operative, depending on who he spoke to. Jack also gained a reputation for his violent tendencies. On one occasion, he pulled out a gun on a journalist named Tom Robertson and shot at him, nearly missing. And the only reason Jack was upset enough to try to shoot him was because Robertson had interrupted him during a discussion. Jack would often show up at the Intercontinental Hotel where most foreign journalists stayed and regale them with tales of how he helped organize the operation to topple the Taliban. One day, he walked in with a box of cassette tapes and claimed that they contained eight hours of Al-Qaeda training footage. On the tapes were target practice featuring Al-Qaeda members rolling over barrels, urban warfare simulations with moving targets, drive-by shootings on the back of a motorcycle, and rappelling down buildings. At the time, the media was paying a lot of money for tapes of Al-Qaeda and Taliban members, and Jack knew he could make bank off of them. He gave them to Eric Campbell, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation correspondent I mentioned earlier, who transferred, edited, and verified the authenticity of the tapes so they could be sold to broadcasters. They sprayed the room a couple of times, and this tells me that at some point they put live hostages in here. We toured the camp with a US Special Forces veteran now advising the Afghan military. For security reasons, he declines to give us his real name. He believes the tapes reveal their fanatical desire to rival their counter-terrorist opponents. We've seen it in limited situations, but not in this wide range. Not in a wide range that includes motorcades, close quarter battle, integrated assaults, open air assaults, linear target assaults, a whole spectrum of terrorist activities. Northern Alliance soldiers discovered the tapes here shortly after the foreign fighters fled. They've come to light only because Jack bought them from one of his intelligence assets, videotaping the heavily armed transaction as proof of payment. This took weeks to pull off, maybe about a month. Uh, it was constant meetings, it was back alley meetings at midnight. It was going to remote places in Afghanistan and the hills and you know, little houses to meet people to try and, and, and convince them to turn all the tapes over to me. A bidding war began for the rights to be the first network to air the tapes. 60 Minutes won the bid for an undisclosed amount. And legendary newsman Dan Rather traveled to Afghanistan to interview Jack for the program. Okay. Ah, uh, please. Shh. Thank you. Thank you. About a half an hour north of downtown Kabul, you come upon this place, a sprawling complex of now battered buildings that once was the heartbeat of Osama bin Laden's training operation. This is where Al-Qaeda created killers. This, put these tapes in context for me. What are we looking at here? Well, you know, they're extraordinary tapes. They're extraordinary tapes because of, of two main reasons. First, they give an insight never before seen into what Al-Qaeda is really about. Al-Qaeda and Taliban have been portrayed as like regular soldiers, like a, you know, they've been portrayed as a military unit um, rather than a total terroristic organization. And these tapes bring that right to light. I mean, they put a different face on Al-Qaeda. They are terrorists, plain and simple. They're killing people on streets. They're kidnapping people off street corners. They're throwing grenades through windows. They're rocketing cars. They're, they're taking office buildings, killing people in cafeterias. I mean, this is absolutely the face of terror. In June 2002, when Hamid Karzai was picked to lead Afghanistan's transitional government, Jack was packing his bags and heading back to the United States. His mother, Mary B. Versace, had died a couple months earlier. So Jack traveled to Poughkeepsie, New York to mourn. Jack remained in the United States for nearly two years before returning to Afghanistan. While he was there, he busied himself by suing a ton of people. First, Jack sued Steven Spielberg and DreamWorks Studios for copyright infringement, with Gary Skurka, Kathy Skurka, and his longtime supporter, Jim Morris, a writer for Soldier of Fortune magazine, as co-complainants. Jack believed that The Peacemaker, a movie released in 1997 starring George Clooney, had a plot which was stolen from an assortment of several manuscripts of his life story. The plot of The Peacemaker does bear some similarities to Jack's story, such as its focus on a backpack nuclear bomb smuggling operation. And although the court noted that there were some similarities between the stories, they concluded that they were not substantial enough to be considered plagiarism. The claim was dismissed and Jack was ordered to pay $260,079 in legal fees which he never did. 
Another person who Jack sued is a man named Eric Cassette, who I was lucky enough to speak to. Eric Cassette worked at his father's car dealership and repossession business when he first crossed paths with Jack. Um, we we had gotten a repossession order, me and my dad, which we owned a repossession company to repossess his car. But he sued us for, he was trying to get a million and some dollars, saying that my dad, my dad was 430 pounds, said he jumped his fence, broke into his business, and destroyed his computers. The first day when we first got served papers from him, he rolled up in front of my, my dad's house with four blacked out SUVs fully loaded with special ops guys. He come to my door and knocked on it with a pizza box in his hand. My niece opened the door and she was like five at the time. He throws the piece of pizza box at her and says, now you're served and threw the, the, his summons at us. Um, we had, we were served papers every day for, for a year and a half, two years. We had to go to court at least once or twice a week. Eric believes that Jack placed his father under severe stress, which contributed to his death. We, we were not rich people. Um, you know, we were struggling just like any normal person. And he was trying to sue us for everything we had, our house, our cars, and probably everything that we'd ever own. Um, and it stressed my dad out so bad that, I mean, he got sick several times. And basically, I mean, he died of septic shock. I mean, his intestines just bound up so much. He killed my dad. He was a criminal. He was a crook. And he was, he was a nasty person to be up against. Around this time, Jack reconnected with his hero, Robin Moore. Robin Moore wrote the book, The Green Berets, which the John Wayne movie was based on. As mentioned earlier, Jack was obsessed with the Green Berets movie, and it's what made him decide to join the Special Forces. Jack and Robin Moore were already longtime acquaintances through the Special Forces community. So when he reunited with Robin Moore at one of his Special Forces expos, and Moore told him that he was interested in writing about Special Forces operatives in Afghanistan, Jack jumped at the opportunity to insert himself into the tale. The book was named The Hunt for Bin Laden, and it featured Jack on the cover with his shirt open and holding a gun. Jack was hired to help Robin Moore with the book as a technical advisor, but found a way to take over the project. Moore's literary agent named Mimi Strong said, Jack came along and rewrote the entire thing. He came up with terribly exciting, excellent copy. According to Strong, the finished manuscript of The Hunt for Bin Laden was largely Jack's doing, with only a few pages written by Moore. In the book, Jack is characterized as a one-man army, an ex-Green Beret operating independently of Central Command who interjected himself in America's war on terrorism as an advisor to the Northern Alliance and who was the only person collecting actionable intelligence on the ground. Jack claimed that he nearly captured Osama bin Laden, that he thwarted al-Qaeda plots to kill Hamid Karzai and Bill Clinton, and that, quote, in March, standing in the middle of a Kabul street armed with a Russian assault rifle and 600 rounds of ammunition, Jack held off Islamic fundamentalists for four hours as they tried to take 18 foreign citizens hostage. The Hunt for Bin Laden was released on December 2nd, 2003, and quickly became a bestseller. It was marketed as the first insider account of the war in Afghanistan. Due to Robin Moore's health issues, Jack took the reins of the book's promotional tour. In media appearances, he was described as a Green Beret working as an advisor to the Northern Alliance. Jack made a lot of money from the book sales because he had the foresight to sign a contract with Moore's agent, which granted him a percentage of the book's profits. Jack also slipped a list of charities into the book, which purported to be for Special Forces operatives, their families, and for the people of Afghanistan. In reality, the donations were sent to Jack's P.O. box and bank accounts. He was later subpoenaed by the U.S. Attorney's Office and charged with mail fraud. Although the book was a commercial success, it received harsh criticism for its lack of credibility. Among its critics were Ed Artis, the Special Forces operatives who Robin Moore interviewed, and many others. Behind the scenes, Jack was outraged that people were publicly questioning his carefully cultivated image of faux legitimacy. He believed that they were damaging his reputation and that they were the reason that Fox News parted ways with him as a regular commentator. In typical Jack fashion, he sued all of them, including his former hero, Robin Moore, Moore's girlfriend, Chris Thompson, and Thompson's parents for $4 million in damages. And he even sued Fox News for letting him go as a commentator. However, most of the lawsuits he filed were dismissed in court. During a deposition, Chris Thompson said that Jack's behavior was disturbing and erratic. He recalled seeing Jack destroying the inside of his own house with a samurai sword. 
He also said that he witnessed Jack choking his girlfriend during a fight and that Jack forged a letter using Fox News stationery in order to submit it as evidence in his lawsuit against them. After spending two years in the United States, Jack returned to Afghanistan. When Jack returned to Afghanistan in April of 2004, he brought along two Americans who were on his payroll named Ed Caraballo and Brent Bennett. Ed Caraballo was a CBS cameraman and four-time Emmy Award-winning journalist. Brent Bennett was a 28-year-old former paratrooper who met Jack in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Jack had a lot of money banked up from the success of the Hunt for Bin Laden book, as well as from fake charities he inserted into its pages, and also from the settlement money from his lawsuit. So as soon as he landed in Afghanistan, Jack rented a house in Kabul to turn it into a headquarters for his own paramilitary unit called Task Force Saber 7. He rented the house under the false pretense that it was for an import-export rug business and tacked a sign in front of it that said Universal Exports in order to conceal its true name, which was the Honeycomb Hideout. Following that, Jack hired four Afghans to join Task Force Saber 7. One of the men he hired was a translator named Abdul Wahid, who was sent to Jack by Afghanistan's then Defense Minister, Mohammed Qaim. Jack had a lot of high-level contacts in Afghanistan, but we'll get to that later. Jack had imitation U.S. military uniforms made to outfit his paramilitary group, and he also bought weapons. And with that, the hunt for terrorists and Osama bin Laden was on. Jack said that a year earlier, he had received information from Al-Qaeda members, who he said that he had flipped into intelligence assets, that they had located the possible whereabouts of Osama bin Laden, and that they had learned of a plot to drive 12 taxi bombs into the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Air Base in Kabul. Jack claimed that when he informed the Pentagon and the CIA about this, they told him to deal with his old nemesis, the FBI. After much foot dragging by the FBI, who Jack described as far too bureaucratic and stupid to stop Al-Qaeda, Jack decided to travel to Afghanistan to stop Al-Qaeda terrorists and to capture Osama bin Laden himself. According to Jack, after he told a mysterious Pentagon insider of his plans, they told him, quote, We can't help you in the United States, and we can't get you into Afghanistan. You get in, and then we'll work together. Within two weeks of landing in Afghanistan, Jack arrested a man who he called a top Taliban official and handed him over to U.S. coalition forces in the middle of the night on May 3rd, 2004. The coalition forces released the prisoner two months later after they determined that he was not who Jack claimed to be. Following that, Jack said that he was tipped off about a terrorist named Ghulam Saki, who was traveling on a bus that was heading to Kabul and possibly loaded with explosives. Jack claimed that he warned the office of Lieutenant General William Boykin, who at the time was the U.S. Deputy Undersecretary for Defense. When Boykin's office didn't reply fast enough, Jack sprung into action and decided that he would stop the bus himself. Jack and the rest of Task Force Sabre 7 then intercepted the bus, unloaded its occupants, and lined everyone up while sticking guns in their faces. He then arrested the suspected terrorist, Saki, blackbagged him, and stuck him in the back of a car to be taken to Task Force Sabre 7's headquarters, the Honeycomb Hideout. Oh. Shit! Now I'm really mad! I haven't broken a mirror in seven years, now I just broke another one. Jesus Christ! After days of interrogation, Saki gave Jack the name of a 30-year-old taxi driver named Sarajan and said that he was in charge of a plan to assassinate top Afghan officials. Sherajan makes the decision of who to bomb the first When the solver's not there, Sherajan's at the charge. Can Sherajan make it? This is after the time I leave this job of these people. I'm very sorry time. I said, I'm sure I'm help you. Please. Well, now he can be with the government instead of against the government. All it took a dollar to see a mukhobla dollar. Okay. Hours later, Jack and Task Force Saber 7 raided Sarajan's house. What's this hiding in your rice bag for? What's that happening in your rice bag for? You're a whole bunch of shit. You're a whole bunch of shit. You're a whole bunch of shit. Magazines too. Inside Surgeon's house, they found some traces of explosives and a detonator hidden inside of a rice bag. In the footage, Swedish and German coalition forces inspect Surgeon's house. Later, the bomb disposal team searches Surgeon's taxi and they find more explosive residue. Then Jack took Surgeon to Honeycomb Hideout. 
He said that he then spent 18 to 20 hours a day interrogating his two prisoners and attending meetings with Afghan security officers and government officials. Jack repeatedly asked his prisoners who their targets were. The two names that are brought up are the former Afghan Minister of Education, Yunus Konini, and Afghan Defense Minister, General Mohammed Fahim. In footage recorded by Jack's cameraman, Ed Caraballo, the former Afghan Minister of Education thanks Jack for thwarting the attempt on his life. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful for, for, for your, uh, for your, what you have done, and especially in this kind of operations. And believe me, I face such kind of uh, uh, things or threats uh, 10 times in a day. He later assisted Jack in his mission to round up baddies by lending him his own security forces. A few days later, Task Force Saber 7 raided the house of an Afghan Supreme Court judge named Mohammed Sadiq aided by German and Swedish coalition forces and Afghan police. Inside Sadiq's home, they found a poster of a terrorist leader, as well as explosives, detonation devices, and bomb schematics. Imports for record for bombs, explosive. After arresting Sadiq, as well as his two brothers and three additional men, Jack dined with the Kabul police chief, Baba John, as well as the head of the National Directorate of Security, NDS, which is Afghanistan's intelligence agency, and the Minister of Education's brother. Following that, the Supreme Court judge's car was driven out into the desert and inspected by coalition bomb disposal experts who confirmed that the car tested positive for explosive residue. So the car definitely tested positive? Yes, definitely. For what? You guys um, are I don't know if there was a, a kind of explosive, but I don't know what, what kind of explosive. We can say, it, okay, there was explosive in it with uh, two sliver dogs. They have a positive, a positive test. Soon, Task Force Saber 7 had eight prisoners in Honeycomb Hideout who they tortured and interrogated for days while Ed Caraballo filmed. However, Jack's decision to arrest an Afghan Supreme Court judge would come to bite him in the ass. Wanted posters with Jack's mugshot were displayed all over Kabul by US authorities. This development enraged Jack, who immediately called the office of Lieutenant General William Boykin and threatened to go to the press if the wanted posters were not removed in 12 hours. You think Abu Ghraib prison is a problem? When they find out that the guy that captured all the terrorists that were going to blow up Bagram, you shouldn't be giving me a fucking DSM. Instead, they're putting a wanted poster out for me. You, you yeah, think I, uh, uh, I don't know what happened. The Georgia supervisor, I've seen it. I don't know what happened. On July 5th, 2004, the Honeycomb hideout was raided by Afghan police forces who arrested every member of Task Force Sabre 7. They were arrested after Jack called Kabul police chief, Baba John, to turn over the prisoners. After the raid, the police found eight Afghan men, some hanging by their feet, bound and hooded in Task Force Sabre 7's HQ. They also found torture equipment, bloody clothing, handcuffs, and blindfolds. The prisoners said that they were tortured and forced to confess to crimes that they had not committed. After Afghan police arrested the members of Task Force Sabre 7, they were taken to a jail run by Afghanistan's intelligence and security service, the NDS. Jack and his cohorts all claimed that they were taken to an underground torture chamber and were subsequently tortured by Afghan officials. In court, cameraman Ed Caraballo showed a large bruise on his foot, which resembled an injury sustained from the traditional Middle Eastern punishment called falaka, which involves beatings to the bottom of feet. Jack's prisoners were also turned over to the NDS, who questioned them. According to Jack's former prisoners, they were also questioned by the FBI. They were all released after 15 days, while Jack, Bennett, and Carl Ballo were charged with kidnapping, having a private jail, torture, robbery, and entering Afghanistan without a visa. Jack has been tortured. Um, Mr. Caraballo has an injury to the bottom of his foot. Uh, the food leaves something to be desired. 
uh, it's not a situation that one would want to be in. I think it's had a psychological toll on all of them, and I know I could not have withstood it for the last two months. How have you been? How's it been in there? Uh, none, of you, none of you tell the truth, you all fucking lie, so. What's your message? Fresh lie. Jack, who, who are you working for, man? Uh, we were working for the U.S. counter-terrorist group and working with the Pentagon and uh, some other federal agencies. So you're agencies. working... You were working with U.S. knowledge, with U.S. government knowledge? We were in touch with the Pentagon sometimes five times a day at the highest level, every day. They've denied Which us. They've denied you officials? completely. Well, we're prepared to show emails and correspondence and tape-recorded conversations that show that that's not true. Why did the coalition put out that email denying any knowledge, denying that you had any links to U.S. military, U.S. government? Uh, we do not know why that is, but we do know that some of the guys we took were extremely high-level terrorists. How, how do you feel about being sort of let go by the Americans? You can't use that quote. <laughs> well, there you go. Quote? That's the quote, my dear. The trial began in late July 2004 in Afghan courts. Ed Caraballo, who was a documentary filmmaker, expected amnesty due to his status as a journalist, but none came. It was argued that since Caraballo was being paid by Jack, he was not working in the capacity of a journalist. However, human rights organizations argued that the men would not get a fair trial due to how new the Afghan legal system was, as it had only been established that same year. Here's Caraballo's lawyer speaking about the state of the Afghan legal system in 2004. There is not a fully developed legal system yet. The International Commission, the Juris Commission to study uh, that came to that conclusion. Amnesty International has uh, expressed concerns. Human Rights Watch has expressed concerns. With that as a, uh, a foundation, this was not a trial. There were hearings that were scattered about the uh, rules that have been uh, generated in Afghanistan were not followed. The trial was a mess. There was only one good microphone which was passed along to whomever was speaking. Jack smoked cigarettes, made constant interruptions, and often stalled the proceedings by making statements to the press. The judge's behavior was questionable as well. He interrupted the defense team's lawyers, telling them that they could not read their full statements. None of the witnesses were cross-examined. None of the three Americans were given copies of their charges in English. Brent Bennett did not have a lawyer, and Jack was not permitted to choose his own translator. During the trial, Jack's former prisoners testified that they were apprehended by gunpoint, forced to wear thick black hoods, held prisoner, and tortured by Jack and his task force. They said that they were hung by their feet and doused with extremely hot and cold water, and also starved and waterboarded. One former prisoner pointed to Jack's cameraman, Ed Caraballo, and said that he tried to suffocate him with a plastic bag. A torture victim named Saki said that Jack and his cohorts beat him before they even questioned him. He said that he repeatedly told Jack that he did not know how to make bombs, and in response, Jack tortured him in the shower with hot water. After they threatened to kill him unless he spoke up, he said that he blurted out the name of Sarah John, who he said he knew since he was a child. There was a sense that the three Americans were left out to dry by the US government, which chose to let them be tried under the Afghan legal system instead of extraditing them and letting them stand for trial in American courts. The most likely reason for this was that Jack and Task Force Sabre 7 were arrested for detaining and torturing individuals at the worst possible time. Only a few months earlier, in late April 2004, news broke that Iraqi prisoners at the Abu Ghraib detention facility were being severely tortured by U.S. military personnel who could be seen in appalling photographs, casually smiling while humiliating and abusing detainees. This erupted into a major PR disaster for the U.S. war on terror. So a few months later, when Jack and Task Force Sabre 7 were accused of running a private prison and torturing Afghans, the U.S. government immediately put out a statement saying, I would treat with uh, a great deal of uh, skepticism any claim by Mr. Adema that he was working for the U.S. government. I can tell you uh, absolutely that he did not work for the coalition. He was not in our employ at any time. 
We did not give him taskings or missions. However, Jack adamantly claimed that he was working with the CIA and the U.S. Defense Department in order to catch suspected Al-Qaeda agents and turn them over to U.S. or NATO forces. For example, we were in contact directly by fax and email and phone with Donald Rumsfeld's office, with the Deputy Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, and with Heather Anderson, uh, four-star five officer level at the Pentagon. Jack also claimed that the FBI had confiscated hundreds of documents, videotapes, and files, which he could have used as exculpatory evidence. And surprisingly, this was true. The FBI, which from what I understand, shouldn't have any jurisdiction in Afghanistan, seized all of Jack's materials and held on to them for 21 days. Additionally, there have been problems with reviewing the evidence. These problems were made worse and the integrity of the evidence compromised by the Federal Bureau of Investigation agents removing the evidence and holding it for three weeks. Once the FBI got there and looked at the evidence, they then found out by the documents that there were tons of documents that showed contact between us, the Pentagon, the CIA, and the FBI, and ISAF. And we contact some you with them? Us, they, the documents and videos showed that we had phone conversations and meetings and there were lots of documents back and forth between us, the CIA, the FBI, and the Department of Defense. The FBI eventually returned Jack's material midway through the trial, but he and his defense team claimed that a lot of evidence was missing and or damaged. Jack believed that his arrest and subsequent sentencing was due to the FBI's vendetta against him. After the FBI returned some of his materials, Jack tried to present his case in court that he was in fact working on behalf of the US government by showing tapes and other files. One tape showed that Jack was in contact with the office of Lieutenant General Boykin, former U.S. Deputy Under Secretary for Defense. On the tape, Jack speaks to Lieutenant General Boykin's secretary, George Shim, who promises Jack that someone from the DIA would call him back on his cell phone. I told General Boykin that you called, I gave him the information. Well, I'm going to have someone in DIA contact you on your cell number, all right? Just give me a couple minutes. George, I am taking out the whole f cell. You're, I'm telling you, you're not going to believe it. It's, it's so funny how I did it. I walked in one bomber to the other bomber, pulled off his mask, and said, identify. I'm going to put Jim Crow on the phone, Jack. Well, I called DIA, and you talk to him, and you tell him. All right, tell him to call me. Here, call me back. Tell him to call me back on this number, because I'm low on box. Okay. Bye. In another clip, Jack spoke to an employee from Lieutenant General Boykin's office after wanted posters of him were put up around Kabul. During the call, Jack was told by an unnamed official that they wanted to put a firewall between Boykin and Jack in order to shield Boykin away from press scrutiny and criticism. So we were trying to put a firewall between your efforts and him because we didn't want to connect anything there, and there's no need to do that because he has, he has no interest in what you're doing. And I'm so with you on that. You, I am so, I am so on your side on that. I am so much a believer in that. I only started talking to your office because I love that man. I think he's probably one of the greatest men that America has ever had. However, Boykin's office claimed that Jack's communication with them was vastly one-sided and sporadic. He was trying to establish a relationship with them, which they weren't interested in. It's unclear if the US government was being entirely honest about their involvement with Jack. Of course, he wasn't officially sanctioned to do the work he was doing, but it's obvious that the US was aware of Jack's activities well before his arrest, and were at least permissive of his operation until he became a PR disaster. Here's the facts. ISAF denied that they had any connections to Jack for three weeks before finally admitting that they accepted a prisoner from him. ISAF assisted Jack on three different raids, and Jack called up the Pentagon frequently to tell them what he was up to. Does this mean that Jack was truly a top secret, covert, special forces, big boss working for the Pentagon? No, not at all. Instead, what I'm trying to highlight is the questionable and guarded stance which the US government undertook when shit hit the fan. Although it can't be proven that the US government supported Jack's mission, it is clear that Afghan officials did. Despite being charged with entering the country illegally, there's footage of the three Americans landing in Afghanistan and being greeted by Afghan officials. They land in Kabul. Um, Ed, who is doing a documentary, documents the entire thing on video, including handing over passports, filling out disembarkation forms. Um, the uh, head of the airport, a man named Haji Timur, hugging and greeting them. Jack Adema going up to the huge picture of Massoud, the great Northern Alliance leader who was assassinated two days before September 11th, uh, and kissing the poster. 
Baba John, the chief of the National Police and Kabul Police, being there and hugging Jack, if I remember correctly, on the tape. On September 15th, 2004, the judge returned after five minutes of deliberation and sentenced Jack and Bennett to 10 years, Caraballo to eight, and the Afghans assisting them to no more than five. This was Jack's cell in Policharki prison. Jack, Bennett, Caraballo, and their Afghan translator were isolated in one wing where they enjoyed a plush prison experience. They had a laptop, a phone, private bedrooms, bathrooms, satellite TV, plenty of alcohol, and a small staff of assistants. So their surroundings looked more like a suite than a prison cell. However, it wasn't always easy living. On three occasions, riots broke out inside of the prison. Four guards and one Afghan member of Task Force Sabre 7 died in a firefight while protecting the three Americans. Bizarrely, it was the Supreme Court Judge Mohammed Sadiq, who Jack arrested and held prisoner for 12 days, that arranged for his cozy conditions. Sadiq told the Chicago Tribune, quote, the government asked me what facilities we should give them. I told them the best. We should give them the best facilities possible. Some suggest that Jack had bribed Afghan officials in order to have an easier time while locked up. It's an unusual treat. Help yourself into the prison. Don't take a picture of me, goddammit, right now until I put my shit on. <laughs> I'll fucking have to shoot you. Alright, hi, alright. Uh, good, good. The place is a little awesome. fucking messy right now. This is Esmerai, Major Esmerai, with the you. first base of the Kent Panch here. Hello? He was one of the guys captured with me. It's Dean Mohammed, he's very famous, Mujahideen. You can see he got the shit shot out of him by the Russians. So for 20 years, he's been fighting the Russians and Taliban. You're living pretty comfortably here in prison. How can you explain that? Northern Alliance. Do you think I'm a prisoner? I think you're an un unusual form of prisoner. You think I'm a prisoner? Do you think I would really spend five years here? I have six Panchair Commandos in this fucking room right now. I could walk out of this prison in one snap of my fingers, and that is no bullshit. If I snap my fingers tomorrow, 1,000 Panchair soldiers will come over these walls, and they'll kill every motherfucker in this prison that isn't Panchair. While in prison, Jack started a website called Super Patriots and began publishing write-ups which promised to tell the real story about his case. He also posted photos, recipes, and videos. Some of these videos still exist on a YouTube channel with several clips of Jack getting drunk while in prison. Action. Super guy! Who's your dad? Who's your daddy? I'm your daddy. Hey, your mama. I'm your daddy. Superfly. Go to Joe Cartoon's side. Because I'm your daddy. Superfly. I'm your daddy. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? I'm your daddy. Yeah, <laughs> During his stay in prison, Jack predictably occupied much of his time by filing numerous lawsuits and appeals. Quote, Adima's attorneys filed a lawsuit in Washington in 2005 challenging his detention. Adima accused the State Department and FBI of illegally keeping him imprisoned in a deplorable Afghan prison, directing his torture, destroying evidence, and ultimately trying to have him killed. He said he had audio recordings and documents to back up his claims. While in prison, Jack started corresponding with a woman named Penny Alisi. In April of 2022, I traveled to Connecticut to meet Penny to conduct an in-person interview. My name is Penny Alisi Idema, Penny Alisi Idema. I was married to Jack Idema. I saw him on being interviewed by Imus before I went to work one morning and I thought, wow, there's a real person that loves our country. That was when he was promoting the hunt for bin Laden. A year later, when she learned that Jack was arrested in Afghanistan, she couldn't believe it. I thought it was horrible. I was devastated for them because I thought he was a true American and he was being treated unfairly because he was out there doing what the rest of us probably wanted to do but couldn't. There were other people fascinated by Jack's story as well and soon Penny connected with them online. A Rita DM'd me on there. They were getting together a cause and they were going to send boxes over to the, the men over there and was I interested? I was totally on board. To Penny it was an important cause. So she got to work gathering items to send to Policharki prison, such as newspapers, magazines. I'd make homemade CDs for them, music. He liked Melissa Etheridge, Sleetwood Mac, anything like that. Soon, their relationship became romantic. Jack called me regularly 
from Paul Charkey on sat phones. We would stay on the phone anywhere from half an hour to four hours. Be dead tired in the morning, but it was worth it. Mm -hmm. I got to talk to Jack. He was funny, he was witty, not really like sappy romantic, just like letting me know that I was gonna be the one. And you know, if he ever got out of there, you know, um, someday we would be together and we'd have great adventures. After dozens of months of regularly speaking with each other, they learned that Jack was set to be released from prison. So Jack knew that eventually he would have maybe the choice of getting out of there. And, you know, he started talking more and more about me and him being together and, you know, finding a location for us to go. But it was never the United States. I had to find a country that would both of us would be happy in. Jack was released from prison in 2007 after being pardoned by Afghanistan's former president, Hamid Karzai. However, he refused to leave his cell. He said he didn't want to leave until he made sure he got everything and then he started with Nina. He wanted Nina to leave with him. And that seemed like a virtual impossibility. How, how could you get a dog out of Afghanistan? Nina was a dog who Brent Bennett found in prison and took care of. After Bennett and Caraballo were released from prison, Jack decided that he would send Nina to Penny, and he actually managed to pull it off. From his prison cell, he sorted out Nina's vaccinations, travel arrangements, and for her to be microchipped. You know, he asked me if he sent Nina to me, would I take care of her? And of course. The first time I met him, I was so excited. I got there and it was like, dum, dum, da, dum. All I could see was him. Again, all I could see was him. A bad, bad dye job. He was sweating and I could see little beads of hair dye. And I thought, oh my goodness, yikes. You know, he's got like hair dye sweat and he's shorter than I thought. And on the phone, he would always laugh and joke when he was calling me from Policharki about how people would make fun of him because they said he was so short and he never was short. And I thought, he is short. He's really short. So anyway, so I was all excited to see him and I just looked at him and he just started being Jack. He started being loud, obnoxious, um, showing off. And we had gone to this hotel on the strip in Cancun and I see him climbing up the building. And I'm like, whoa, what's he doing? And he didn't stop, he just kept climbing up the building like Spider-Man. You know, and I looked at the people around me now are looking and I just met him. So they're like, is that your boyfriend or your husband or whatever? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, what's he doing? I'm like, he forgot the keys, he's getting them. And somebody said, common sense, why doesn't he just go to the front desk? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I go, it's the way he is. He got in, he got the keys and you know, most people would go down. Nope. He had to come down the same way he went up. And now I'm totally <laughs> freaking out. I'm embarrassed. I'm humiliated. And he's like, everybody thinks this is cool. And I'm like, oh, this guy's fucked up. Soon Jack rented a condo in Mexico, but in time he was evicted from it after he was arrested for selling drugs. And I wasn't there when it happened, but it was over drugs. He was arrested. He was put in jail. So I got the money together and I wired it and got him out. Typical Jack didn't tell me what happened, didn't thank me, just told me that um, another fucking problem. That's his exact words. And that was when I was getting sicker and he decided that um, I had to have been getting sick from the air conditioning down there. And that was when he decided that he was gonna start a lawsuit against the condos. Now, he just got out of jail there at that condo where he just started trouble and now he's gonna sue them because I'm sick. Nothing was making sense. It was insanity. The next thing I knew, he's on the phone telling me, well, I'll have to put that on hold now because now I gotta get out of here real quick. They want me out. Fuck them, I was gonna leave anyway, but I'm suing them all. And I'm like, oh my God. Where are you going? He goes, well, I met this guy, Gringo Dave, who's got a really great, great mansion in Bacalar. He goes, it's in the jungle. It's still in Mexico, right? He goes, yeah. At the time there was one road in and one road out. 
and it was a three hour drive in each direction. So he went down there and he fell in love with the place and of course it needed a lot of repairs, a lot of renovations. Jack worked night and day. He did everything to get that place into the place he made it finally. And it was a lot of work, a lot of work. He put in a complete plumbing system from the lake. There was maids coming and cleaning it twice a day. Um, there was a housekeeper, there was bodyguards. There was a really good security system. It was great. It was, it was beautiful. And one of the main things that he was obsessed with was keeping us safe but he wanted to have broken glass on top of those walls with um, bob wire and all that because he was always afraid somebody was gonna try to scale it and come in and hurt us. We would have drills, but I would never know when they were coming either, just to make sure I was prepared. Um, you know, in the middle of the night, he would clap his hands like at two in the morning, wake me up, say, we gotta go, somebody's coming in. I didn't know. And he'd be like, we gotta get right away, somebody's coming in. You know, and he had a gun underneath his pillow and he grabbed the gun, you know, and it was, we're running down the steps. And of course, in the beginning, I thought it was real. And then I realized it was just drills just to make sure we were prepared because as the walls got higher, the paranoia grew with it. He would put a gun in a baggie to go take a shower. Nothing made any sense. In his mind, it was all perfectly normal, mm -hmm. but it was just more paranoia on top of paranoia. One of the only videos featuring Jack that's publicly available is called Jack Idema Christmas Katana. In it, he studies the blade in his backyard. He'd be out there with a sword like that. And if I didn't play with him, that's what he would say. Come on out and play with me with your sword. It's like little kids, you get dressed up and you play whatever you, you know, cops and robbers will play swords. Get dressed up in your sword outfit. So I would stand out there for a few minutes, play swords and then just put the sword down and go in the house. And he'd start screaming, yelling, ranting, raving, and run around and start chopping everything up. And then he'd put the music back on and play swords by himself. It was around this time that Jack got started on his next business venture, a military air cargo company called Star Aviation. Well, it never got, it never got off the air. There was, it, and it was Jack's fault, nobody else's, because everybody, we had the meetings and everything else. We had the funding. Um, we had all the DOD clearances. We had everything. But Jack, as usual, he had the attention of a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. And everybody was invested in this. They were totally on board. So what does he do? He just throws it all aside and decides to open up a, you know, a, a boat thing, you know, boat rides. He purchased a pontoon boat and started a company called Blue Lagoon Boat Tours. And he made a website for the business called Oceans11Mexico.com. The boat tours, you know, it had to be based on Jack Sparrow. And, you know, he had to act like, and he would actually stand in front of the mirror and act like that. Do I get it yet? Do I, am I acting like him? Am I doing it right? Jack flew a pirate flag over his compound, and he also started going by the name Jack Black. That's because it sounded like a cool pirate name to him, and not as a tribute to the famed comedic actor. He needed ID to go get the electric bill, the utilities bill, put in his name. So he couldn't think of anything, and then he thought black sounded really cool and dark, so he'd use it. By mid-2008, Jack had been living in Mexico for over a year, and nothing was working out. Star Aviation fell through, the boating business was not profitable, and he wasn't writing the book that he was given in advance for. Jack needed money, and luckily for him, he had a way to get it. His father, Herman John Idema, was 87 years old and in rough shape. Jack's father was born on August 21st, 1920, in Beacon, New York. He was a World War II veteran who fought in the Battle of Iwo Jima and became a builder and developer of exclusive neighborhoods in Poughkeepsie, New York. Jack was aware that his father would die soon and he wanted to ensure that he would inherit his estate. They were, they had a falling out when I took Mr. Idema, the elder Mr. Idema down to see Jack. They were fighting and all Jack wanted was for um, Mr. Idema to just sign the building over to Jack and Jack didn't, or John didn't want to do that to Jack. He didn't want to give Jack the building. He still wanted it in his name. Jack wanted to inherit a company called Isabeau Dakota. Isabeau Dakota functioned as a shell company to conceal Jack's assets from creditors. Jack's father had given the building to him for his business ventures sometime in the 90s. Well, his father absorbed a lot of the costs because anything affiliated with Isabeau Dakota, his father didn't want a bad credit rating and he didn't want to have any problems with the law or anything. Yeah, he owned the building, but 
he let Jack do whatever he wanted to do with it. It's a building in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and it consisted of three different dwellings, if you will, inside of it. And one was the ultimate pet resort, one was the bat cave, where his home was, and then the other part was the kennel. He rented it out to a church, and the plan was is to get the church to renovate the whole thing, pay for everything, do it, and then evict them. That didn't happen at the end, but that was his plan. Jack came up with a plan to collect his inheritance. There were a few roadblocks which needed to be sorted out, such as his inability to step foot in the United States because of legal troubles. Therefore, Jack decided to get married to Penny in order to put everything in her name and to sidestep any legal issues preventing him from collecting his inheritance. On November 21st, 2008, Jack and Penny held a wedding ceremony at their compound in Bacalar. Three days later, Jack's father died. I was president and then technically I was in charge of everything. And then obviously, if something happened to me, then the lawyers and Jack would have everything. Soon, Jack was living the lifestyle you'd expect from every insane, drug-addled American living in a compound in the Mexican jungle to have. Flush with the money he inherited from his father's estate, he started using large amounts of anything he could get his hands on, such as cocaine, heroin, and booze. His dealings with the bizarre demographics of people that were coming in and out made it not happy. And that was also when his drinking and his drug use was in increasing. So yeah, I would say that's when it got really bad. In time, Jack lost interest in being intimate with Penny. He instead preferred to keep company with a young college student named Fernando and a transgender sex worker named Nancy. He started hosting all night orgies at his compound, which he advertised on gay hookup sites. How did you feel like when you actually realized that Jack was gay? I guess it bothered me when I saw him making out with a man and he wasn't making out with me like that. I just felt like I, I couldn't compete. I definitely can't compete with a man. Forget women, I couldn't compete with a man. Because I pretty much resigned myself to the fact that this was just a uh, marriage and name only and I had to think about it and decompress when I got back and figure out what my next move was gonna be. Didn't realize that was gonna probably be, probably the last time I'd ever see him good you know, before he had his near fatal accident. Penny left Mexico with the intention of never seeing Jack again. But then the exact same day that she landed in Connecticut, Jack got into a life-threatening car accident. In the hospital, Jack called Penny's phone and said this. What on? Hello? Hello? Jack there? Huh? Jack? Jack, oh, okay. Take the fucking board out. Listen to me. Listen to me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I leave everything to Penny, and you to manage it with her. Be good friends. I don't know about Nina. She was okay, but I think she's in the hospital too. I have a broken sternum, a collapsed lung, a broken arm. Actually, T11, 12, 13, 14, L4 and 5. I have a broken right wrist, a broken clavicle, and, 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 and I have a. Oh, oh, oh. I have, I have concussion. I have a fractured skull in the front right eye. I have no right eye. Fuck, I'm going out of it. I fucking just put a patch on me and the fucking do it. Hey, listen, cremation. I want to be cremated, okay? And if you guys, you put me in here in charge, okay? Okay. Hey. I tell Penny she was. Tell Penny she was right. She was right about everything. Her dream was right. Okay. Um, where Where are you? I mean, in the hospital in Chennai. I'm trying to get them to move me to a private hospital before I die because I have internal bleeding and they, they won't even really look at it. I can feel it. The, I think I left my spleen and also my, my kidney. Okay, should I call the <laughs> embassy and try to get the embassy involved? No. No, I'd rather die, okay? 
Just get a hold of Kenny. This is the number. Stay on this number. You tape recorded this? Yes, I am. Okay, I leave everything to Penny. You to manage it. Sell the bill. Sell the play in the house. Okay. Do well. And, and, and do start. I, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I'll take you to the private house if I did. When I was on my way back to America, on his way back to Bacalar, he had that accident, and everything changed from that point on. A few days later, Penny returned to Mexico to take care of Jack and to help him rehabilitate. Jack started to abuse the pain medication he was prescribed to, as well as illegal drugs and alcohol. The situation was grim. Jack was miserable, bitter, unthankful, and constantly high. Penny was losing patience, and then she started to feel ill. I was getting sicker, and he decided that I should go be tested for HIV. To my surprise, he wanted to get the same test. I thought that was odd. I thought all this was odd. We got tested, and the results came back, and they were positive for HIV. And I wanted to make sure what I was hearing was proper because I didn't think it was right. But um, Dr. Dennis said that Jack was going to get worse, but I could go home and I could get better. And Jack freaked out. Jack just went ballistic. He took the phone, he broke it, and I honestly thought I was going to die. That was all I thought. I went home, I got to get away. I was quiet. I told just a select few people that this that I had this. Then I called up Jack and told him how sick I was and I just collapsed. Jack wanted me down there immediately. He also didn't want me and he kept saying, I hope you're not telling anybody, I hope you're not telling anybody. And of course I did tell some people. Actually what I did do was I started therapy. I stayed with my local HIV. That's when I started up with my local HIV AIDS group and I started going to support groups. I needed help. I couldn't tell him that because I wasn't allowed to say anything, but I needed help. I was scared. And I went to a great support group and they helped me. You know, they were helping me and all of them said, don't go back, don't go back. He's evil, he's gonna kill you, don't go back. Well, Nina and Tinka were there. I had to get them. Uh -huh. Nina is the dog that was rescued from Afghanistan that came to me and Tinka was our Mexican kitty. So in July, um, I made plans to go back. I walked into the house and it was different. Everything was different. It wasn't clean like it used to be. There was dead flies everywhere. The door was broken. Everything was dirty. You could just, you could smell sweat, alcohol. It was just disgusting. And he just looked at me and he was happy to see me, but his eyes were just black. He looked like he had been up for days. He reeked of alcohol, cigarettes. Natalie, the maid, she was telling me other people were coming too. So everything was there and they were getting worse and everybody was still coming in. All of the sex fest constant, it was worse than ever. Okay, and how many people have got this now? My plan was self-preservation. And when I say that was the plan, um, if you can understand this and try to wrap your brain around this, the plan involved killing Jack and getting my dog and my cat. So I went into the bedroom. I took the gun out from underneath the pillow and he was at the computer. He turned right around and he saw me aiming at him and I was screaming at him. He was screaming at me. And I said, you took my life. I'm going to take yours. The gun went off. I don't really know what the hell happened, but um, he grabbed me and he started hitting my head into the marble stone, whatever the heck the place was made of, just kept hitting my head into it nonstop. I was in so much pain, I just collapsed. He picked me up, threw me in the extra bedroom, started smacking me really hard, beating me, and I just didn't think I was gonna make it. I'm on the office floor, I pick up the phone, I call my girlfriend, and I called her, and she picks up the phone, and she's like, what? I go, Jack's trying to kill me. I need you to call the embassy, call Ed Carabella. I said, call him, I need to get out of the house. He's gonna kill me. Jack grabbed the phone, he said, the fuck did you call? Blah, 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 and he's hitting me. He throws me into the bedroom and he takes the Nublafina and he injects me with it. Not just one shot, two shots. I am out of it. The next day, as he said, he wanted to play Rambo. So um, I'm petrified of mice. So he put a couple in a bag and put them over my head with the bag and I fainted. And now I've got 
like bites on me. My head's still killing me, by the way, from having it slammed and my eye was so messed up. So I was freaking out. So he took the cuffs off. He started being nice. And he said, you know, just tell me who you're working with. I wasn't working with anybody. Okay, again, the paranoia was kicking in. He was messed up, completely messed up. The noble feeling he was putting in me, he was putting 10 times in himself. Plus he was doing coke, he was doing everything. He was drinking like there was no tomorrow. He was messed up. So this went on for a couple of days. Again, nobody's at the house. And then finally, so he comes up and he says, he's like, there's two fucking bastards down here, downstairs, you've got to talk to. My friend got in touch with Ed Carabella and he called the Mexican embassy and he told them what was going on. And there was two guys to come to get me. They came to check the situation to see if I was there to get me out of the house. So I wanted to tell them, but he had his gun in his pocket. He goes, you say anything. He goes, I'm gonna shoot you and them. He would have, definitely. One was translating and he kept staring at me and he kept asking me, and he goes, you all right? I go, I'm fine. Everything's fine. We just had a fight. You know, we're married, we fight. He goes, you really all right? And um, Jack's like, who the fuck reported this? Who, why are you here? So the guy goes, we're just here, you know, um, we're just checking to make sure. He goes, I wanna know who the fuck reported this. And so he's like, we were just making sure. Somebody said they heard an American woman screaming, which sounds reasonable, because I was screaming. So as we start walking towards the door, the guy that didn't speak, wasn't speaking Spanish, that was speaking English to me, goes over to me, he goes, it's really good to meet you. And he put his hand out. When he put his hand out, I grabbed his hand and I took my fingernails and I stuck them into my in his hand. So we realized what was going on. So he held on to my hand for a minute. Jack goes, what the fuck's going on? And he just went like this. He was squeezing back like he knew I was in trouble and he was going to get me out. Okay. So they left. Jack made sure they were out. He was furious. He just kept putting buckets upon buckets of water over my fucking head. I thought he was going to drown me, and he said he wanted to take me out in the back, but he was afraid somebody would see. So he was going to wait till I died, and then he was going to drop me in the cenote. He already told me that, and plus I, I already knew because I heard it on the phone. He just kept doing that, and he kept asking me the same fucking questions. Who did I work for? Who sent me there? I kept saying, I don't know what you're talking about because I don't work for any of these people. I don't know these people. Yes, you do. You've been here to destroy me. No. Okay. I want, you took my life. Yeah, I was going to kill you, but because you gave me HIV AIDS, not because of anything else, not these people. I have nothing to do with these people. Yes, you do. And he just kept going and going and going. <laughs> I just kept hoping that those guys would come back because I really thought that guy was going to come back, but it seemed like he wasn't going to come back. And then I heard a really familiar voice. He's like, Plummer, he's like, didn't you go back to America? Jack said, you go back to America. I'm like, no, I can't get out of here. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, I, I can't leave. He's going to kill me. So he knew what was going on. He goes, I get you out. So. This went on, this went on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning. He comes back and the door opens and he grabs me. He goes, let's go. I go, let me go get Tinka. He goes, no, no. I go, but Nina and Tinka, I came back for them. He goes, you gotta go, come on. He goes, I can't save you if you don't come. I had to leave them. So we're running, and his helpers are trying to distract Jack. And the plumber gets me in his car. He takes me into the middle of Bacalar. He said, go to the hotel. He goes, use a different name. He goes, you stay there. He goes, I'll call police. He goes, you call police. You call people in America. He goes, you got to get out of here. You can't stay here. He goes, I'll get you out. He goes, just, just let the police come. Go to the police. They took me to Chetamo. 
they questioned me, interrogated me. Um, they asked me if, and I, there was a whole language problem, if I would strip. And I did, I totally stripped. They took um, an internal, they took tons of pictures, everything. They said that was the only way they could press charges, and that's fine. They had to do that. And um, I pressed charges, and they put me under protective custody, and they said that they were going to take me Monday to the airport. They got me to the airport, and um, they told me really quick, get go stay near the airport, just stay there, wait, exchange your money, get out, don't come back. You're going to be killed if you come back. I was so happy to be home in America, but the, the next business day, it wasn't bad, bad, but uh, it was all over the Mexican news. So he was furious because they were getting ready to put him under house arrest, and he was over the top. Jack Adema is back in the news. Noah Schachtman over at the indispensable Danger Room blog calls our attention to the fact that Jack Adema has resurfaced, apparently holed up in a house in Mexico. According to local news reports, local police in Mexico want very much pleased to talk to him about accusations that he held people in his house against their will. I thought that was when the nightmare ended. It just began. The harassment, the stalking, the nonstop freaking calls, threats, the messages to my parents. Yeah, um, nonstop harassment. After Penny escaped, she couldn't afford her HIV medication. This was because Jack put credit cards in her name and ran up a lot of debt, which he refused to pay back. Additionally, since she was the president of Isabeau, Dakota, the medication she needed was not covered. Therefore, Penny emailed Jack's lawyers, asking them to remove her name from the company and for her credit cards to be paid off. She gave them a deadline to fulfill her request. If not met, she threatened to dispose of corporate assets in order to satisfy her debts. In response, Jack wrote, There is no more vindictive, treacherous bitch in the entire world beyond you. After the deadline passed, Penny sold the deed of the Isabeau Dakota building for $10. In retaliation, Jack, along with loyal fans he met online, posted revenge porn of Penny to blogs, pictures which they also sent to her parents. Jack all started these blogs about me being a whore, Penny's a whore, putting up pornographic pictures and everything else, and wound up that we started fighting in court over the Isabeau Dakota building and my name on that stuff, and I wound up doing the right thing. I turned the building over to Harvest Ministries, I didn't get a cent. Harvest Ministries deserved it. They fixed it up. I wasn't gonna let Jack and them take it from them. I wanted nothing to do it. I wanted to do the right thing, and I did. In 2012, I got a call. While well, I was talking to Jack, honestly, back and forth, it was just screaming and yelling. And it was like, I guess maybe he thought I would go back. I don't know, or what. I mean, by then it was just too messed up and everything was out and we were in, we were, we were in litigation. And finally, that was it until January of 2012. We talked, and um, I knew what was coming. Uh, we talked on Skype for the last time, and I said, you know what's going to happen? He knew what was going to happen, and I said, um, he said he was sorry. He hopes I could forgive him, and I said, yeah, but I really can't. I don't know, whatever, and I said, I'll see you on the other side, and I said, I'll call you Friday night, and he said, well, that may not happen, and I did try to call, but the phone just kept ringing. And he was dead the next day. So. How did you feel? Relieved. It was over. Sad, relieved. You still loved him at that time? Up until then. Now I hate him. Now I see that at the time I didn't realize, but he messed the sixth nerve palsy in my eye, killed it. And it just sort of floats into my nose, all like goes over to my nose, and I can't control it. And I have intense headaches. And also, as a result of what he did to me, not only the eye problem, but um, because of that, I also am now on seizure medicine. And I'm also on a blood thinner because I had a blood clot go into my brain because of the eyes and the seizures. There you go. So I also wound up with not only the side problem, uh, seizures that I have to be on medication for the rest of my life on and warfarin for blood clots for the rest of my life and HIV medicine, which once you get to the HIV, you have to go on meds for the rest of your life. 
So, um, yeah, that was that. And I'll add that um, he put me in just a bad way. It did nothing for my self-esteem, um, killed my relationship with my family. Yeah. And I don't know. I can't change anything, and... I'm not, you know, I don't miss him, but, um, yeah, it is what it is. There's one last question I have for you, Penny. Sure. Um, when I first talked to you and when you sent me the files, there was something that you kept mentioning is very important, and it was the birthday video. Can you tell me about the birthday video? That birthday video, really, he had, I wasn't there, and it was his birthday video, and it was the last birthday before he, the, he had another birthday, but it was the video before, the birthday before he died, and I wished I could have been there, but the reason why I like it, and it's so important to me, is because that's what I remember him to be, happy, funny, laughing, Nina getting all excited, and he made that video for me because I couldn't be there. That was what I wanted. That was what, yeah, I know we had this terrible thing, but maybe if he had just told me, maybe, maybe we could have done something together. Maybe we could have had all that. That's the Jack I want to remember. The happy one that was laughing, that was the good Jack. That was everything good and maybe people will say well you're an idiot you shouldn't say that but that was the jack i want to remember the happy one being silly somebody pushing his head anybody touch him there was times if you touch him you, you better run because he's going to kill you but that it was the funny happy jack carefree somebody pushing his head in the you know a face in the cake laughing nina getting all excited you know that was good times those were the people at that point I cared about. I thought that was going to be my new family, my new life. That's what I want to remember. But it's hard with all this, this bad and what was left. What he left me with and what I remember are two different things. That's my story. Thank you, Penny. Thank you. I can't do this. Oh, God, that was hard. Okay, guys, we are done. Jack, 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 you didn't know that that was going to happen, did you? <laughs> It's tradition, it happens on everybody's birthday. That's why I say, Morida, and you go fight it, and someone puts your head right in the face every time. Is that son of a bitch? Oh no, I'm not putting my head there again. Just get one wish, mate, just one wish. Uno nada más, uno nada más. Hey, Penny. Hi. So you saw the documentary. Uh, what did you think? I loved it. I'm so pleased with the documentary. I think it was really, really articulate. I think it was well thought of. It was well researched. It picks up where a lot of the magazine articles and the editorials and all the little snippets that somebody would say about him on TV, after, especially after he passed away. I think it just clarifies everything. And you see the depth of the deceit. I think you bring to light the extent of the cons and how the litigation, because, yeah, they say he's a serial litigator. I've said it. But when you actually look at all the cases in detail and he was 
always suing somebody. Even when he was incarcerated, he was suing. But unless somebody does, like you did, a documentary of it, nobody really realizes how insane it was until you actually spell it out in 90 some odd minutes. A couple of months ago, you mentioned some uh, some really terrific news uh, that you currently have no trace of HIV in your system. Am, am I correct? So ever since everything was really bad in 2010 and I was pretty much next to dead and I had a lot of illnesses to battle over the years, um, I've come to a point now in the last couple of years, definitely, where my blood work was stabilized. And the only reason that it was disturbed at all was because, of course, COVID. And um, yeah, but now, as long as I eat properly and my exercise and just basically live good and my numbers are good. My CD4 count is above 1200, which is outrageous. That's great. That's good. That's better than even a regular person that has nothing wrong with them. So that's, I'm kicking butt on that. And I'm undetectable, which means I have no trace of HIV in my system as long as I adhere to my medications and, you know, do all the right things that you're supposed to do. But it was a long struggle to get there. And that could always change if something else, an opportunist infection hits me as COVID did. And uh, by the way, I was fully vaccinated. So it it happens to a lot of people. It wasn't just me. After you watched the documentary, uh, you told me that there were, there were a couple of people that uh, you wanted to make sure to thank. Right. When everything really was bad and I exited Mexico and everything was falling around me and I was lost and I had no direction. And Jack, his little disciples, his lawyers, the Jack Idema fan club are coming at me full force. Um, Sir Edward Artis and Robert Pelton reached out to me and they were just such guiding forces in my life. They kept me together. They worked with me to get through all this they just gave me so much support. Again, they're the reason why I'm I'm so well, doing so well today. So Penny, any final thoughts? This really is important and I don't like talking about it. But the reason why this HIV is really hard for me is because my numbers may not be good all the time. And the thing Jack took for me more than anything, yeah, he took all that other stuff and yeah, whatever, I can't get it back. But the one thing he took for me that I have to live with every single day of my life is he took the gift of intimacy for me. I'm afraid to get next to somebody else, even if my numbers are good, because I am so afraid. Even with condoms and all that, I am deathly afraid of being close to someone. He just killed that for me because I know what it felt like to have somebody give me this. And I am deathly afraid of being close to somebody and that's he just totally took that for me you know because in my mind I know that you know there's protection and all that but it, it's I just no it's just I'm always afraid what if what if my numbers aren't good what if what if there's an accident what if a condom breaks what if and he destroyed that for me I mean I just have no I am just deathly afraid of being close to people. I mean, sexually and even trusting people in a relationship because once you've been hurt, like I've been hurt, and I know a lot of women will understand this. Once you've trusted somebody so much with everything and they abuse you and hurt you so badly and so personally, you never recover from that. You just never recover. You never do. You All the therapy, it helps. And you think you might be okay and you might be able to do it. But once you get too close to somebody and all your guards come down and you start thinking, oh, I can be really close again. And you just think about what happened when you were really close to somebody and you think, I I can't go through that hurt again. And that's it. That's that was what he took for me more than anything. I don't I don't trust people the way I used to at all. And forget about relationships. Yeah. Some of them might work and 
they might not. And I'm willing to try, but inevitably, Jack will pop his subliminal ugly head into my relationship. And um, there's always that call. There's always that chat that you got to have with somebody about this whole HIV thing. And it, it's the deal breaker. You know, even if you're safe, some people just don't want no part of it. And it's just a constant thing. You got to work on it every single day. And anybody living with HIV will tell you the same thing. You know, they try not to be conscious of it. We try just to go on with our lives. It doesn't define us, but we live with it every single day. And to have that in your mind, constantly knowing if you do this or you do that, and you got to be really careful. And, you know, it's just difficult. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to be close to people. And um, it's very difficult to you're remembering it every single day, maybe for a second. Maybe not really that long, but it's there every single day. When you take that pill, you remember every day. Ooh, yeah. Can't forget that pill. Forget that pill. I'm not going to be undetectable. I'm going to be detectable. Um, Yeah. It's just, you gotta, it stays with you. Doing this documentary gives me a voice. Unless somebody does, like you did, a documentary of it, nobody really realizes how insane it was until you actually spell it out in 90-some-odd minutes. Thank you to all of my patrons who've helped make this documentary possible. I've spent several months and thousands of dollars on this project, and I probably won't even make a quarter of it back relying on YouTube ad revenue alone. I love making documentaries. I love taking the time it takes to make them as good as possible. But at this point, it's starting to seem very unsustainable. Therefore, I'm hoping to hit a goal of $3,000 a month on Patreon by relying on the good faith of the people who've been watching and enjoying my content all this time. So there's perks. You get director's commentary on all of my videos, uncut interviews, early access to my videos, early cuts of my projects, your name at the end of each video, as well as a digital comic tied to my Secret Space Program video, which features me as a space samurai fighting Kevin Spacey's clone in outer space. So yeah, please help me reach my goal of $3,000 a month on Patreon. And with that, I can continue to pursue what I'm passionate about and make my work even bigger and better. All links are in the description box below. And as always, until next time, 